Good morning, everyone. I'm Nick Finicor, Politico's tech editor, and I'm thrilled to welcome you back to Politico's third Artificial Intelligence Summit. We're thrilled to open the second day of the proceedings here uh, with top-notch co uh, conversations with top thinkers and influencers across Europe to discuss uh, Europe's approach to AI and concrete strategies for implementing AI. I'd like to particularly thank our speakers, some of whom have uh, rescheduled for, confirmed their participation from March when we had to reschedule this summit due to the coronavirus crisis. And I'd also like to thank our leading global partner, Qualcomm, presenting partners, Philips and Palantir, our supporting our organizations, Orgalim, the OECD, the Future Society, France Digital, the German Research Center for AI, and the Swedish AI Council for supporting us today. Before I begin, I'd like to remind you of a few housekeeping rules. You can ask questions at any point, but only through the Politico events app in the box under or next to the, uh, the live stream. I want to make this as interactive as possible, so please pose your questions throughout the day and tweet about the event at hashtag PoliticoAI. Now I'd like to turn your attention over to our senior policy reporter, uh, Lauren Serilis, um, and I'm very pleased to welcome Commis European Commissioner for Justice Didier Reinders for a 30-minute interview on Europe's approach to AI. Thank you, Nick, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to be hosting uh, the first uh, discussion of this morning. Uh, I'm Laurent Cyrulis, senior policy reporter uh, covering cybersecurity and technology policy at Politico. And I'll be having a conversation with uh, the EU Commission's Justice Commissioner, Didier Reinders, this morning. Reinders, as Justice Commissioner, um, his portfolio obviously spans uh, issues of consumer protection, issues of, uh, of privacy and, and, and data flows as well, um, and issues of discrimination and fundamental rights, all of which have increasingly been challenged by new technologies uh, like artificial uh, intelligence. Um, the questions I'll be asking him, ask him, him this morning uh, will go into those issues of discrimination, as well as how Europe should deal with uh, these issues uh, when comparing uh, the continent to other parts of the world, other regions, such as the US um, and China. Um, I'm just going to check if uh, the Commissioner is on the line with us now. Um, Commissioner Reinders, can you hear us? We will have to give the commissioner a little bit of time to join us uh, online. Um, in the meantime, let me direct you to um, a poll question. As you know, uh, during our summits, we like to um, ask uh, questions to our audience uh, via the summit app. Uh, we have a poll question out uh, that's linked to this session uh, this morning, uh, which we'll, uh, we'll be asking you on the app. Um, and the poll question uh, in the case of our discussion with uh, the commissioner is, and I'm reading it out loud now, Europeans will trust AI applications more when the EU drafts new laws to impose liability and require tougher standards on non-discrimination. It's the first choice. Second choice, European regulators better enforce laws like the GDPR to limit the use of personal data. Third choice, regulators engage more with companies as they develop new applications. And the fourth choice, governments stop using high-risk technologies like facial recognition. Those are the four options, and the question again is, Europeans will trust AI applications more when? If you want to uh, participate with that poll, uh, please do go to our uh, our application uh, of this summit, uh, and I look forward to seeing your responses later today. We're still waiting for um, the commissioner, and I'm being uh, informed that he will join in two minutes, so please bear with us. And the commissioner has joined us online right now. Um, good morning, Mr. Commissioner. We're just checking the sound. If you could bear with us just one more minute. Thank you. Sound, I'm sure. Good morning. Great. You hear me? Good morning. How are you this morning? Fine. Good first, and you? I hope so. 
We need to stay safe. We're, we're well, and thank you. I want to thank you again for joining us uh, at our uh, AI Summit. Um, we really appreciate you, you attending, and, and I appreciate uh, the discussion that we're going to have about uh, issues of discrimination, fundamental rights, respect for fundamental rights, and consumer protection uh, within uh, the space of artificial intelligence applications. I think it's, it's, it's cutting edge. It's uh, all new challenges uh, that uh, we haven't faced in the past decades, and I think it's very interesting to, uh, uh, to have this discussion with you. Uh, just if you don't mind, because it's such a busy morning for Belgian politics, um, let me just ask you one thing about that. Uh, the Belgian uh, uh, parties yesterday announced there is a new coalition government, and I just wanted to get from your perspective. I understand you're, you are a European commissioner, so you left Belgian politics for now, um, but from, from the perspective of, of the European Commission, uh, what does this mean for Belgium as a partner, as a, as a country, and what does it mean that after uh, 16 months there is now finally a federal uh, government. No, it's time. It's time to have a government after six, six, 16 months. And it's sure that uh, to discuss and to dialogue with uh, the government, uh, but also with the different ministers, it's better to have a uh, uh, minister in charge with a full competence and with a majority in the parliament, because of course it's easier to discuss about the reforms, to try to uh, insist on some improvement in different fields when you have uh, the capacity to discuss that with uh, ministers in charge, with also the capacity to go to the parliament, first to the government, but to the parliament, and to have a majority inside. We have seen that in many member states. If you don't have uh, the real capacity to uh, have a majority in the parliament, of course, it's very difficult to organize a reform process. And now you know that we have huge discussions on the uh, MFF and the next generation EU. I know that there is a huge support in Belgium about uh, such a kind of evolution in the financing of the EU policy. So it's also very important to us to receive an additional support with a real government. But again, 16 uh, months, it was uh, enough, I'm sure. And it's very important now to have a real uh, new government and to take part maybe from uh, such a government to all the different discussions of the uh, uh, European level with more um, effectiveness. Last, last question on that before we turn to AI. Does it make Belgium a more credible partner within the European Union? It's not uh, really a question of credibility. We have had many discussions uh, so with uh, the previous uh, governments and the different ministers in charge. Uh, it was possible to, to organize a process, but it's a question of efficiency more than the credibility. Of course, if you have a clear majority, if you have a government with a full support of this majority in the parliament, it's easier to make some progress in some fields. And that's the real uh, uh, element that we have seen now. It's not a question of credibility. It's more a question of efficiency. Great. Well, thank you. And um, I'd like to turn to artificial intelligence now, because that's what we're here uh, to discuss uh, this morning. Um, so maybe first of all, I think there's been a lot of discussion about uh, how artificial intelligence impacts fundamental rights, uh, impacts uh, issues of discrimination, uh, of liability as well, and of consumer protection. Um, can I just ask, as sort of a, a, a general uh, impression, how concerned are you, and what are the areas of artificial intelligence where you're seeing it being, being, uh, being uh, put into practice that worry you most when it comes to the protection uh, of fundamental rights? The most difficult uh, issues are, in fact, uh, opacity. When we have black box, it's quite difficult to uh, have a clear uh, vision, of course, in the black box about the, the risk. And the second element is that is the risk-based analysis. So we need to see what are the more risky, maybe not so much sectors. Of course, there are sectors with a high level of risk, healthcare or mobility, uh, but uh, also the risky applications. We want to work with uh, uh, verification, uh, application by application, and use by use of the different applications, what are the, the risks. And so that's the main issues. We want to work on a risk-based analysis, and we want to do that with uh, a, a real uh, capacity to understand what is it, uh, the artificial inter intelligence, and what are the elements uh, against, uh, that we can use against the opacity of AI. Uh, because AI is more than just uh, learning machines or expert systems. There are many automatic systems that it's very important to analyze. And again, to see what kind of opacity we have inside, 
and what kind of risk it's possible to have with the use of application in some projects or in some services. If I can single out one, um, your uh, colleague um, at the European Council, uh, Charles Michel, uh, President of the European Council, he said earlier this week that, and I quote, insurance companies using our individual data with artificial intelligence to select clients and optimize pr profits is not acceptable, full stop. Um, do you see Europe going for some kind of ban on AI in industries like insurance? No, it's not too bad. It's uh, the correct use. And it's true that it's possible to have discrimination and bias in the use of AI, also in the insurance companies. But uh, the intention is not to ban the use or the development of uh, the artificial intelligence in some sectors. It's to put into place uh, a regulation with enough uh, possibilities to verify the situation. So to be very concrete about insurance, but about other kinds of sectors, it's possible to ask a better documentation, to organize a testing of the AI use, and to organize also a, a real control on it, maybe with a certification um, a priori, if it's possible, ex ante, but also a control on the possible uh, discriminations during the development of the application in the use and the use of this application in the sector. And that it's uh, with the super supervisory authorities and maybe with the judges, with the judicial systems, that we need to have a real capacity again to understand what is it uh, the um, artificial intelligence use in the uh, development of one service or one product, and so to have an access to the algorithm to understand the functioning, and maybe not directly for the judges or for the uh, uh, people in charge for the supervision, but from experts delegated by those those uh, institutions. And that's very important. So it's not to ban the use and not certainly not to ban innovation and development, but to, to have enough capabilities to control and to verify uh, the use of AI to avoid any discriminations and to avoid the development of actual discriminations because we have already. I have, I have two questions on that. I think um, if you talk about uh, the abilities to, to, to check and to assess, um, there's two aspects. Maybe a first one, um, how confident are you that uh, regulators, that, that uh, supervisory authorities, as you mentioned them, um, have the right tools and resources uh, in place across Europe to actually do this? Because it's, it's a complex area, artificial intelligence. First of all, I want maybe to say that it's not just to control, right? because uh, we are speaking immediately about the control and the, the way forward and that, is to build a real trust. And so uh, with the supervisory authorities and with the judges and the just judicial system, uh, we need to be sure that it's possible to build a real trust between the companies using AI and the consumers, the citizens also, because uh, authorities are also using AI. And it's important to build a trust also between the authorities and uh, the, the citizens. But for the companies, it's very important to build such trust because it will be a, a good argument to develop their activities. But to go back to, uh, to your, questions of, your question, of course, uh, we need to be sure that it's possible to have enough resources, financial resource, human resources. If I may, it's possible to make a comparison. We have the GDPR. After two years of the GDPR about the data protection, the personal data protection, we have seen in an evaluation report that it's needed to continue to make efforts for a correct implementation of the GDPR. And a part of the implementation is to give enough resource, human and financial resource, to all the data protection authorities at the national level. It will be the same in such a case. Uh, we need to be sure that it's possible to have enough resources. And so we'll follow that very closely at the Commission level. But it's not just for the uh, supervisory authorities. Uh, we have a strategy about AI and about the development of AI in Europe. And you know that we need to invest more in skills uh, through education, in research, of course, because uh, we have a lot of things to do in research at the European level. And we need also to push pressure and to help the companies to invest more in the development of AI and the use of AI uh, in Europe. And we try to organize a data center and to organize a, such a kind of, de of development. So the question that you raise is a part of the problem. We don't have maybe enough skills and enough research uh, capabilities and enough investment in Europe about AI. So we try to push that. And in such a way, we need also to push pressure on the supervisory authorities to be sure that they have enough resources and enough uh, 
uh, resource not only in the financial side but also in human uh, side and human resource that means more skills and more capabilities and of course it's the first task maybe of the commission to verify a correct implementation on all the decisions that we are taking to what extent does gdpr fill that gap how confident are you that gdpr covers uh, most of the issues that we're seeing with discrimination, uh, you know, obviously also privacy and, and, and the dangers of big data. Is, is, is this covered with GDPR or are we looking beyond GDPR to other legislative, maybe even regulatory tools? For some elements it's covered by GDPR, but it's a protection of data, it's a protection of personal data. But we need to do more than that because in the use of uh, artificial intelligence, there are new challenges. And it's the reason why we have launched a consultation uh, we have received 1,200 uh, reactions and contributions in such a consultation, and we are ready to come with new regulations. We are thinking about a new regulation in the first quarter of next year. But to do what? There are three maybe main elements. The first one, uh, we have uh, discussed again and uh, about that, um, discriminations and protection of fundamental rights. Of course, we are using the GDPR, but we need also to verify what are the data used in a, a, a process, what are the possible bias in the use of uh, uh, this, those data. And it was the remark about the insurance company, this is possible remark for many others. Uh, to be very concrete, uh, there is a, a risk of a gender bias in many uh, use of uh, artificial intelligence. And so we need to have an access. And again, we need to uh, fight against the opacity of some uh, applications. We need to have a real uh, capacity to understand what is it and so to have an access to the algorithm. But then we need, of course, to discuss also about the, the safety. And that's it's more than the GDPR, of course, safety of products and of services. Or it's possible to adapt our directive uh, to be sure that it's possible to take care of the safety of the consumers uh, in relation with products and services with inside some uh, applications using AI. And then the liability, who is responsible in the case of uh, a damage? Uh, for the moment, we have uh, a regulation explaining that the li liability is uh, on the head of the producer. But it's maybe also possible to say that there are some elements of liability on the head of uh, the developer of uh, an application. And so uh, to, to take the classical example that we are using, if you have in some years more and more cars without a driver, autonomous cars, in the case of an accident, of course, we are sure that the driver is not responsible because we don't have. But is it the producer of the car? Is it the owner of the car? Is it maybe the developer of AI? It's better to uh, know the risks not only for the, uh, the, the consumers, but also for the companies. If you are knowing the risks, it's possible to cover the risk. And so uh, there are three main elements, and it's, of course, more than the GDPR. The GDPR will help about the use of some uh, AI applications for the protection of personal data. But then you have more than that in the opacity of some AI uh, about the discriminations, and you have uh, uh, liability and safety issues. You mentioned the, the consultation that followed the white paper, uh, which got a lot of responses. So just out of curiosity, does the commission use algorithms to go through those responses? Or do you have a human check, uh, an official who goes through every single one of them? I'm quite sure that for the moment we try to use a, a human check. And uh, to give a, an example, I, I'm insisting on that, not only at the EU of uh, uh, the, um, the commission, but I've had many discussions with uh, the Minister of Justice about the digitalizing of the justice systems. You know that it's a real issue. We need to invest more and more in uh, digital uh, uh, development in the justice systems. But of course, um, we need also to take care of a possible uh, uh, discrimination or risk due to the use of AI. And again, there also, we need to have a human decision at the end of the process uh, to uh, take a decision in justice, it's better maybe to use AI in the ways to search documentations, to work on the uh, case law, but at the end, it's very important to have a human uh, decision. And it's the same in the recruitment. And it's a part of the business to uh, analyze the uh, uh, techniques that they are used for the moment by 
different companies in the recruitment about um, uh, AI because they also there are some possible bids. If you are using uh, the data from the past, of course, again about the gender, you will have maybe in the recruitment of people in the high level functions. Uh, uh, an evolution, a uh, use of AI may have such a, a discrimination uh, issue that you are uh, referring all the time to former people in for, to, to, to former positions uh, at a high level for men and not for women. And so again, there it's very important to uh, to have a human decision at the end, but also to verify the content of the data used uh, by AI. Mm -hmm. You mentioned black box, uh, the issue of black boxes and 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 opacity uh, in 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 algorithms and in artificial intelligence applications. Before, how do you expect to solve that uh, in terms of regulators? Do 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 you know the authorities supervising uh, companies on this on these issues? Do they need you know to get into the black box? Do they need to crack open the black box? Do they need to look at it from outside and look what it does? How do you police that? How do you control that? It's possible to do that earlier. We will work, I said, on a new regulation, maybe in the first quarter of next year. But if you look to uh, the possible discriminations, the first element is to put maybe some requirements about the documentation. Uh, what are the informations uh, provided by the uh, producer of goods and services, uh, with including AI or applications in their development? So it's very important to work on the documentation, testing, it's also very important to organize maybe testing before to come to the market and then maybe certification in some cases uh, ex ante before to go to the market. Maybe more, I said, for the, uh, the, risk, the risky application. So we need to work on the risk based analysis. That is for the first phase. So it's possible to work before the use of uh, products or services on the market. And then, of course, um, in the uh, the way to control the process and ongoing control, uh, and we need to give to the supervisory authorities enough capabilities to have a real access to the so-called black box or to uh, understand better the algorithm, uh, to have a real uh, control of it, and to, to verify if there are some possible discriminations or not. And you know that we'll have development in the use of AI. It's possible to come to the market with a product or services, uh, with AI inside, with an application inside, but then you have an upgrade and you have developments of such, such an application. So it's very important to control all the time during the whole life of the product or the services, uh, the, the possible BS or the possible uh, discrimination. So it's possible to do something with requirements at the beginning of the process, but it's very important to have real control. And again, there we need to invest in skills, in research, uh, we need to invest uh, uh, in many different kinds of uh, infrastructures to be sure that we have enough uh, capabilities also for the supervisory authorities. I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about uh, the global dimension of, uh, of artificial intelligence and, and, and Europe's uh, quest uh, to catch up uh, with that race. Uh, I think a lot of, when we talk about discrimination and fundamental rights and, and, and issues of privacy, etc., a lot of the issues or a lot of the, 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 the reporting around it, the, the, the more controversial stories around it, um, oftentimes involve companies that are not European. Um, for instance, in the US, there's a, there's a lot of discussion around Clearview AI, uh, which is a facial recognition company using, uh, using facial recognition from across the internet. Uh, they have a little bit of a role in Europe, um, the European Parliament has looked into this case. Uh, so that's one example. Another example that I might um, uh, come up with is, um, is a surveillance uh, company C and CCTV company Hikvision uh, from China, uh, where again, we have a lot of questions around how do you work with, uh, with a Chinese company um, when it comes to surveillance technologies. What, what's your take on the role that these companies can play in Europe? Because obviously, uh, they come from a different background when it comes to values, and they come from a different background when it comes to business, uh, business cooperation and, and, and commercial interests. Uh, so, so how do you deal with these companies in Europe? But we are dealing in two different ways. First, to answer to your question, of course, if there are companies coming from abroad and trying to uh, be at work in the internal market, of course, we will ask to fulfill all the different uh, uh, rules that we have put into place uh, about the data protection, GDPR, but also in the future about the new regulation 
concerning AI, it's very important to explain that uh, the rules are in application not only for all the open companies, but for all the companies at work uh, in Europe. And that's very important. So we are not uh, closing the borders. We, are, we have an open market, but we ask to have a level playing field and to apply the same rules. So to give an example about facial recognition, uh, we have some uh, elements uh, to answer to, to such a possible use in the GDPR. It's forbidden, except in some specific case, you need to have a real uh, uh, important public interest and you, have, you need to have a national law. And so it will be very important, not only for European companies, but for companies coming from abroad to fulfill the different kinds of rules putting into place maybe one day in a national law in application of the GDPR. And so the GDPR and the future regulation on AI are fully uh, in application for all the companies that work on the internal market. But we are working in another way. We try also to promote our rules, our principles abroad. And so we try to have a good cooperation uh, with different partners. And if you look to the situation after two years with the GDPR, it was possible to see a very positive evolution in many different places in the world about the, pers the, 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 the data protection, the personal data protection. And we have seen new regulations in different parts of the world. And uh, we try to work uh, with a very good cooperation uh, with many partners on this. And about AI, it will be the same. We want to have a human-centric approach. It's maybe all specificity at the, the AU level to have a human-centric approach. And of course, we try to convince different partners in the world that it's very important uh, to fight against discriminations, to protect fundamental rights. And we try also to say that it's not only in the, the way to give uh, a better situation to the, all the citizens and the consumers, it's also for the companies and for the authorities. Because again, to, through that, it's possible to build a real trust, a real confidence between the citizens and the authorities, between the consumers and the companies. And in the advantage of all the different actors, of course, it's a long way because uh, we are not so far to have an international regulation on this, but it's the goal. So a level playing field for all the companies coming to Europe and European companies that work in Europe, but also to try to promote our regulation of views about uh, the way to protect fundamental rights uh, abroad. And I want to say that uh, it's in line with the rule of law and all the, the different values that we are sharing at the European level. And we are more and more convinced that we need to do the job at home. Yesterday, we have published a report, the first annual report on the rule of law in the European Union. It will be easier to speak about the rule of law with our international partners uh, with such uh, uh, capacity to do the job at home inside the European Union. It's the same when we are speaking about personal data uh, protection or about AI. If we are organizing the process in Europe with a real level playing field for all the companies with open borders, if you fulfill all the criteria, it's easier to go to different partners and to say, you need to have such a kind of uh, concern about fundamental rights, about discriminations. You need to put into place maybe some regulations on safety of the product. I have had many discussions with the Chinese customs about the safety of products during the pandemic. And we have seen that it was possible to have better cooperation because at the beginning we, have, uh, we had some doubts about masks or other equipment uh, to protect the people uh, during the, the pandemic. And due to a cooperation, it was possible to have a better uh, evolution in the safety of products. And now we are in discussion again with the Chinese authorities about that. So uh, we are working on both sides, the fulfillment of all the criteria for all the companies that work in Europe, but also the promotion of our vision uh, out of Europe. And that is uh, not uh, to impose our vision, but to try to convince, and we, we discuss with many partners on that. Explain it well when you say this is work in progress, this international uh, development where we're trying to get uh, other parts of the world um, to follow the same standards as, 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 as exist in Europe. But obviously this isn't the reality right now. And I think if you look at companies offering services in Europe, some of them, let's say US or Chinese companies, will have developed their algorithms, will have developed their technologies uh, it, under different legal uh, frameworks than, than exist in Europe. So looking at the situation right now, 
Would you advise, for instance, would you advise governmental authorities or governmental ministries uh, against using uh, technology uh, that comes from the US or China uh, when they go into areas like facial recognition? But we have two, two differences. First, you know that we have had, a, and we have a huge debate about 5G, to give an example. And more than that, uh, we have uh, a discussion about a possible protection in strategic sectors uh, for investment coming from abroad, because we need to be sure that there are no risks in such a kind of investment. And there are some new evolutions at the open level with new mechanisms uh, to protect uh, some strategic sectors against possible use of uh, uh, technologies coming from abroad. And that is a, a logical evolution. But uh, to be clear about the, uh, the contacts with the authorities, we will uh, come with a regulation. And again, it will be uh, to, to organize a level playing field and to ask to all the companies to apply the same rules. So if you are coming to Europe with AI in a product or in a service, uh, it will be possible uh, it must be possible for the supervisory authorities in Europe to have access to the algorithm, to verify the content of AI, and to verify that there's no discrimination inside. So uh, it's not to say that we are just using data located in Europe, uh, because I know that there are so many discussions about the localization of data. I'm, of course, uh, supportive for the process to invest more in Europe, about the data management and the data storage and uh, many other things. But we are very open also to receive products and services from abroad with inside some uh, AI uh, and some uh, application using AI. But we need to have the same kind of access. Of course, maybe not uh, uh, in the same way all the time with the same mechanism, but it's perfectly possible to ask the same documentation, the same testing, uh, to ask also, of course, uh, to give an access to the super authority. So again, we will work in the same way, but we are knowing that there are different views for the moment at the worldwide level. But if you look to the, again, to the GDPR, we have seen in Brazil, in South Korea, in Japan, in uh, Indonesia, to give an ex a lot of examples, but also in California, in the US, positive evolutions to start with not exactly the same regulation, but the same approach to protect the privacy and to, and it will be the same here because it's not just, if I may, a fight against discrimination. It's also other discussions, like I've said, about uh, safety and liability. Great. I wouldn't want to let you go without at least once uh, asking you about uh, data flows, international data flows, because obviously this is a big issue right now in Europe uh, with technology companies uh, digesting the, the ruling that came from the European Court of Justice on Schrems II, uh, which is essentially forcing them to relook uh, at the legal basis for their data flows outside of Europe. Um, just out of curiosity, how do you think this impacts uh, the development of AI uh, in Europe right now? this ruling and the legal uncertainty that, that has come from it? No, well, in fact, uh, the way to uh, reaffirm uh, the real decision and commitment at the EU level to protect the personal data and to have a real uh, uh, regulation and uh, supervisory uh, authorities to do that. Because you know that we have uh, all the national data protection authorities and the ball at the EU level. And of course, uh, it's a specific issue uh, it's maybe uh, involved in the trade issues, but first of all, we have a regulation on the protection of personal data. So it's first a question, again, of fundamental rights, privacy, and human-centric approach. And so uh, we don't have an impact uh, from uh, that in the, in the way to develop AI, because uh, at the contrary, we have uh, launched a strategy about the data at the open level at the beginning of this year. We have launched a white paper on AI, and the goal is to invest more and more, not only in the infrastructure, not, but also in research, as I said, in skills, because we need to develop it to be sure that we will play a, a major role, uh, a role of front runner in the development of AI in the future. So that is clear. But of course, we need to, to solve uh, the situation that we have now with different partners. You know that we are working with adequacy decisions when it's possible to uh, see that we have a, quite the same kind of protection in a third country than at the European level, and we have some adequacy decisions. The most important data flows is maybe with Japan due to such an adequacy decision, but we need also to see if it's possible uh, with the US uh, 
uh, to organize a short-term solution after the decision of the court. And for that, we are working on the standard contractual clauses used by many companies. And we are working on additional possible safeguards. And we are doing that in very close collaboration with our US counterparts. First of all, with the Trade Secretary, uh, Wilbur Ross, and with the European Data Protection Board to be sure that it's possible to provide more and more certainty uh, to the company. Not only the US company coming to Europe, but also European companies at work uh, in the US. And right. then we will work on the longer term solution. And you know, longer term solutions, it's maybe more in line with uh, very sensitive issues like national security. And I know that there is more difficult maybe to, to find a way, but we have very good discussions for the moment. And so right. it's not, you don't have, I, I know that there are many reactions and maybe your question was in such a direction yeah. to say, it seems to be an obstacle to have those rules about data protection or fight against discrimination. No, it's not an obstacle, it adds value. Because if you have that, it's possible again to build trust. And for a company, the trust of the consumers is maybe the most important element. Great. I thank you a lot. We are unfortunately out of time, uh, but I thank you for taking the time and for being so uh, generous uh, to, to join us uh, at the summit. Um, I hope we'll, we'll, we'll speak again uh, soon. I'm sure uh, the audience uh, at home uh, found it a very fruitful discussion. Uh, and thank you uh, all at home for listening uh, and uh, here in the room for, for, uh, for listening uh, uh, in, pres in presence. Um, we're, our next session uh, is coming up at 9.45. Uh, it's going to be an interesting one. It's going to be looking at the national implementation uh, of everything happening uh, in Europe uh, on artificial intelligence. And we're going to have not one, not two, but three um, national leaders, uh, ministers and state secretaries uh, from across Europe uh, on stage. Uh, so stay tuned. Thank you. <laughs>